while, met her husband, left the state for a period of time, but uh, has then come back. She's now in uh, over on the vet school in uh, veterinary population medicine in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, when she came back initially, she was doing diagnostic work in endocrinology, um, but uh, over the last six years has focused more on quality assurance in the research setting. Um, and I think it'll be an exciting topic to talk about, and uh, we welcome uh, Rebecca Davies. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's just a real pleasure to be here um, from over in the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab and, and College of Veterinary Medicine. And I'm really, um, what I'm hoping to do today is just um, perhaps give a little food for thought. And what I'm very interested in is at the, at the end or during or throughout the talk, getting a sense of your appetite for, for some of the um, issues associated with uh, the, the topic of research reproducibility. So the title of my talk is Strategies for Improving Research Quality and Reproducibility. And basically what I'd like to um, touch on in the next hour or so are the threats that I'm sure most of you have heard about or are considering or are wondering how to meet the new um, NIH grant proposals requirements in, that are in response to these issues. Um, I'll go over a few of, of what our stakeholders, the stakeholders who are interested in the data we generate, what their strategies are for addressing the issues that have been, um, that are really gaining in momentum in terms of attention throughout throughout the scientific community. And then the question I really want to uh, discuss with you and, and hopefully plant some seeds about it, um, relate to what about us? What about the scientists and the institutions who produce the data, generate the data, um, come to the inference on the data? Where are we in this discussion of research reproducibility? Um, and then at the, hopefully around the middle of the talk, I'll, I will switch to this idea that I'm working on over in the St. Paul campus about could we learn from the quality assurance best practices that are already being used in regulated work, could we in a voluntary way capture some of those best practices, adapt them to our basic research, and use that as a way to stand up for the quality of our work and, and provide some credible evidence that we can trace our data over time, which should help us reproduce our data, okay? So what I'm aiming for, and what you'll see as, as my objectives, were really to, um, if you haven't already seen what the current responses are of, of our stakeholders, give you a little sense of that. Um, I wanna be able to provide, at least, at least in the handout that I've given you, some resources that if, if any of these ideas capture your attention or you want to try to make a start at integrating some of these best practices, where could you go to find some good um, roadmaps to that? And then I always want to ask you to help me consider the challenges of bringing this idea into an academic environment because it is new. It's not something we've typically done. It's definitely got an element of make work. And so I, that's the discussion I'm interested in uh, with you folks if we get time for that. So as I start, you know, what I, what really intrigued me about maybe ways we could do things different are thinking about our data. No matter what type of data we collect, no matter what kind of scientists we are, whether we're at the bench or we do population medicine, whether we're interested in policy, whether we do quantitative or qualitative work, it's all about data that we collect, no matter how diverse those data are. And truly the whole idea of research reproducibility um, depends on data stewardship. How are we dealing with and managing our data? <clears throat> so I'd like to start with, with um, considering the reproducibility cr um, crisis as it's being known. And I just wanted to get a, a sense of the people in the room. If you were asked this question and were given these answers, um, thinking about research in general, the research that you do, the research that you um, have been a part of, that you read, um, how many would say, uh, um, if I asked you is there a reproducibility crisis, would say, I don't know. Okay, we got a, we've got a taker, no, couple, okay, yes, a slight crisis. I'm not sure how you can have a slight crisis. When I have a crisis, 
It's not slight. Okay, slight couple, slight crisis, thinking maybe there's something to this conversation. And yes, a significant crisis, several hands. All right, let me show you what readers from Nature, how they answered this question. You'll see that all of our responses are represented there. Um, <clears throat> About 40% think there's a slight crisis, so they understood that terminology better than I did. But um, so Nature had a survey for their for their um, subscribers and on the website, and so this the population of 1,500 or so people that responded either came in through the web or were subscribers. So we'd I'd like to think that those people at least have the kind of experience that's here in the room. Um, and, and so it looks like scientists or people who are interested in science think there is a crisis in re research reproducibility. So in your own experience, if you think about this broad bucket term, do you have procedures in your lab, in your work, in your mind about how to address research reproducibility? Anyone have a suggestion? Or if, if I was to ask you this question, how many would say yes? Yeah, some? And some of us would say no? So if, if you were to, what would your procedures be? How would you describe them? So you're, you're, you're monitoring your, your methods and you're proving to yourself that the methods are working and you replicate experiments um, when you think you're onto something and you want to be sure, or even all the time. I think that's what we as scientists tend to typically do, right? We, we, we design our experiments and then we try to confirm them um, and then we put them out there for the rest of the world to confirm as well. So I think you are like these folks who are also responded to that question. And the most popular strategies were repeating the um, studies within the lab. Now, whether we do that in a systematic way as a standard procedure, that's a whole different story. But as a, as a driving force of our, of our confidence in our own results, we tend to have some mechanisms in place to make us believe our own data, right, before we try to share it with anyone. So um, the responders in this survey also um, you know, provide some probably not very interesting information in terms of timing, but 34% of them say no, which is, is, is um, maybe reflective of the question because many of us in the room said no as well or at least didn't have a, a, a quick answer to that question. But um, if we just look at the question itself, that might be a little bit surprising, right, that, that we haven't thought about this as much. Now, I think part of the problem with that question is what does research reproducibility mean? And this could be a whole seminar on itself. But I wanted to share with you some of the um, thoughts of um, the authors of this paper. Uh, and John Ioannidis is, uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with him, but he's a real guru in this area, epidemiologist at Stanford, who's now building an entire program on research on research. So, you know, how, how are we... How are we doing? How does the way we do our research impact on the quality of our work? So he um, describes in this paper what, I'm not sure if you can read there, but I think it's very true that this research reproducibility term that's being bandied about right, left, and center is truly non-standard and definitely unsettled across our, our scientific industry. And so one of the issues we need to think about is what do we really mean by that? And in, in um, thinking about that, any thoughts on if you had to describe research reproducibility, what kind of characteristics would you be looking for for the research? And just shout things out because I'm sure you can think of confusions related to the term. So. Okay, so replicating your data using the same experiment. Any other suggestion? Replicating the analysis of the data. Yes, taking the actual data that somebody has shared or provided for you and using the, that requires the exact same analyses, right? And um, 
that's another definition. Anything else? Transparency in your methods. So being able to look at your methods and replicate them. Now that sounds like something as scientists we should be able to do very well. And I'll show you in a few slides that it's something we disappoint ourselves on repeatedly. All right, so we're, we're hitting the targets that were in this paper. Um, he offered these suggestions that methods reproducibility is, I think, your first description. If we can reproduce with the same data and tools. I'm sorry, the second one. So we've given the same data, you, you're using the exact same statistical methods, surely that's something that can be reproduced. But it requires consensus on what those um, analytical tools are and how many analyses were performed. So it does require some collaboration and understanding. And you can see as you read that first paragraph that you could take the same data and same tools and perhaps come to different conclusions. Results reproducibility is corroboration, all right? So a new study, but using the same methods. And in that case, we need to understand the error around the measurements, right? Which is not always easy, especially in basic research, when we're not maybe sure yet. It takes a lot of replication to understand, be able to tell the signal from the noise. And then inferential reproducibility, I think this one is really interesting. Um, making the same conclusions. Now you put three scientists in a room, you give them some data, and you may end up with three different conclusions based on the inferences that they're making. So I think this kind of exercise helps us um, as we think about research reproducibility and as we kind of reach for the targets of what is it we want to do as scientists or what is it we can do as scientists. So the, in this paper, they also make um, this point that none of these types can be assessed without complete reporting of all the relevant aspects. And for me, this is the hopeful part of, of our problems with research reproducibility or lack thereof. I think there's significant low-hanging fruit that we could improve on that could probably lift the boat significantly and that probably wouldn't be that difficult to do. So if we can work on complete reporting, what you're going to see as I talk, this is um, something I keep going back to, that perhaps we can make some changes in how we report data. So the whole issue of research credibility and reproducibility, of most of you seen um, what you see on the screen here already? Um, so and this is only some of the types of, of publications and, and documents that have been um, uh, published in the last th three to seven years or so. Now the one, um, Bagley's here, Ray's Standards for Preclinical Cancer Research. As I've been looking back at this literature, this really seemed to be a trigger to get a lot of the momentum going. And this paper looked at, it, or it, this is an editorial commentary on a paper where Amgen looked at um, cancer studies. And, and have you, do you know this paper? Stop me if I'm, um, telling you a story because this is a, really a pivotal story. So they decided they're, they're looking into where should Amgen, this cancer research program, therapeutics, be looking um, what research is the most promising to them that they should in, perhaps re invest in repeating to focus where they're going to focus their attention on. So they took 56 studies that had been published um, and that they thought were extremely promising and they set about to reproduce them. So 56 studies, they worked with the, with the authors, they followed the materials and methods. Now remember, these are cancer clinical tr um, trial type work, so it, you can imagine that it would be difficult with perhaps individual cancer cells or cell um, or tumor issues. But would anyone like to um, guess what the reprodu re reproduction rate was? As scientists, knowing what we know about how hard this is, so no one's going to guess 100. 50%. Anyone want to go higher or lower? I, I, when I first um, asked myself the question, I was thinking 40 to 50. That's where, that's where I have that kind of faith in, in the scientists I know and in the quality of uh, my work. Well, it's very disappointing. 
find out it was only 11%, so six of these studies. So this really captured um, the attention of scientists and funding agencies and, the, and truly the whole community of, wow, if this is true, is there something we can do to improve on this? And, and that really was um, a call to action, which many, and many of you look for NIH funding in the room. Yep, and, and you've heard about the new standard, the new requirements for research reproducibility coming from this kind of um, study. And this isn't the only one. There, there are several others throughout the scientific community and in, in, in other disciplines as well, physics, psychology, um, translational medicine, have come to the very similar results, all right? So 11, 20, 30 percent reproducibility. So that's what's behind this new focus. Friedman is, a, is an economist and he published this paper where he tried to put a cost to um, irreproducible research. And he did that by looking at papers that have been published and he tried to, he tried to evaluate with his team which of these papers could, I repro could be reproduced and if not, why not? And if not, what could be an economical economic impact of that? And as he um, wrote this paper, he made this observation that the true cost of, of the problem isn't necessarily that the work we've done to begin with has been poor or bad. That's not it. It's just if we can't reproduce it for whatever reasons, and I'm going to share some with you, it's this lead on, the, the, the providing false leads and delaying alternative, alternative discoveries that adds to this cost burden. So what he showed was that the, the U.S. annual budget for research, now this is NIH, this is all the government funding agencies, this is academic institutions, contract research organizations, private research organizations, is about 56 billion a year. And according to his study, half of it goes in the irreproducible bucket. Now you folks know how hard we work to get funding. And when we think about what, what the funding agencies, what the, the kind of disappointment they're going to be experiencing with these kind of numbers, um, you can see why this is becoming something that as scientists we have to come to grips with and see what we can do to mitigate some of this risk. And so as he looked at these numbers and said, all right, half of the money is going to irreproducible work. Why is that? Based on his analyses of these different papers, what were the categories that contributed to the fact that he didn't think they could be reproduced? And what you see on the screen are those four categories. And if you're familiar with the new NIH reporting requirements or grant writing requirements, you'll see that they noticed this paper as well. So biological reagents and reference materials, 36 percent of the papers evaluated, you could not reliably reproduce those reagents, either I uniquely identify them or get your hands on them again, all right? Um, study design, now this one doesn't bother me as much because study design is tricky, it takes a lot of experience, you're, you're going to get it wrong sometimes, um, so it doesn't surprise me that maybe 30 percent of the um, problems with study design and there's a lot of effort being put into improving study design. I know you folks get a lot of training in it. There's a lot of attention being um, placed now in the, in the um, scientific community about how can we do better with study design. Um, data analysis and reporting, about 26 percent, you could not replicate based on the data analysis. Hmm, why is that? That seems like something we should be able to nail down. And then laboratory protocols, 11 percent, just not good enough to be able to replicate. Your, your comment about maybe our methods aren't, you know, described well enough to repeat. So this is, this is research on research. This is very helpful to try to figure out where should we start, what can we do to um, mitigate some of these risks. Now those four categories um, provide us some insight. But there certainly are others that um, could affect the quality of our work. So this um, image is meant to 
help me explain that um, these questionable research practices in the middle, these are the, the kind of, this is the science bucket, all right? This is where we really need all of our, those of us as scientists who are working, where we take our expertise and we work hard with statisticians to figure out how are we doing with the design, how are we mitigating bias, um, have we selected the right analyses, and um, do we know what we're doing with statistics, and are we doing too much with statistics, and are we misusing statistics? So this whole bucket of questionable research practices is kind of where um, that the paper I just reviewed is focusing on, where the NIH is focusing on, and for all the right reasons where our educational programs are focusing on. But we also have a lot of potential for just um, carelessness, our habits, um, the behaviors in the lab, and I'm going to give you some evidence for this, and perhaps our reliance, our, our, our significant reliance on mentoring in the scientific, in our typical scientific um, journey, we're highly dependent on mentors, but remember those are individuals, so there could be an immense variability in the quality of the mentoring we're getting. And then, of course, there's fraud, but the truth is fraud only constitutes about 1 to 2 percent of the problems with reproducible data. And those of you who have gone through the, the training that we get on responsible conduct of research, it's almost all focused in the fraud area, right? Plagiarism, fraudulent, um, fraud, um, and, and mixing up budgets. So a lot of our training is focused in that area, which is a very, very small contributor to um, research reproducibility issues. When it happens, it's bad, but it really is thankfully minor. Now, none of these issues I'm talking about address the incentive system, which is really being hotly debated by people in research integrity and by the stakeholders I'm going to talk about. There's a lot of conversation about our, our um, reward system is flawed, that we are producing us, or we are living in a system that rewards quality, at, no, I'm saying that exactly wrong, rewards quantity over quality, that we're using somewhat meaningless um, classifications based on journal impact factor. And so there's a big discussion on that, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I always get asked about it. So I want you to know that a lot of um, policy makers and journalists and the funding agencies are talking about this and they're going to want to talk to us about it um, as institutions at some point, if not already, okay? So let's move on to these stakeholder strategies. These are who I consider the stakeholders, the people who care about the fact that we're generating data and that we're um, creating our inferences. So we've got the publishers who write. They, they're depending on us to give them good data so they publish good data, so they're not embarrassed by retractions and by um, problems with our data. Certainly the funding agencies who don't want to give away half of their funds to go to work that um, can't stand up to the test of time. And then similarly, the government agencies, professional organizations, um, like uh, the ones I'll be talking with you about, uh, uh, people like the... Um, uh, American Society for Quality, and then the, some of the um, scientific professional organizations are really focusing hard on this issue in a way to help their members address some of the concerns. Private research organizations are talking about this, and then of course the public, who we can, um, we really do not want to encourage any further disrespect for the quality of our work, right? We are already... Um, we, we can't afford to offend the public any anymore, but they certainly hear these studies and, and have an opinion on the quality of science. So what are the stakeholders doing? Well, the journals, um, groups like Nature and Science and, and many of the um, significant publishing agencies, they are working on this. They're probably the first to the table to, to bring groups together and say, what can we do? What, what piece of this do we own? Um, to try to help improve um, this issue. And so their nature, for instance, has realized that this small materials and methods section that they were requiring was too small. And they have now do not have those same limits. You can now give appendices. 
Um, they have also um, provided a new checklist for authors so that authors can see if they've you know, met their target. They've also decided to employ a lot more statisticians so they can get better statistical review of manuscripts. They, they have, um, there's been a consensus from these um, publishers that, that um, is now provided to scientists and scientists can react to. Uh, so they're at work in this. The NIH, again, they have their new principles and guidelines for reporting preclinical research and you're probably not the only um, university who's very interested in this. Every university is struggling trying to figure out how do I meet these new requirements and the NIH is struggling thinking how are we going to review um, the new contributions. So here's what they, what they have um, decided to do and you're, you've probably seen this. But they're updated application instructions and as you read through these, think about the Friedman paper where there were those compartments of what contributes to irreproducible research. And you'll see that they're, they're trying to get at this here. They're saying, all right, we, we want more detail in um, your premise. And this is an interesting one. What they say is that, you know, we typically write our proposals and we give our hypothesis and we say, here's all the evidence that supports my hypothesis. And they're now telling us that's all well and good, but we also want to hear all the, uh, a summary of the evidence that does not support your hypothesis and that suggests you might be wrong. Which as good scientists, we've probably read that. We know it exists um, because that's how we figure out what we want to do. But they want to know about that now in the proposals, which seems like a fair, fair request. Rigorous experimental design, they want more details, more justification, they want to feel good about it since 30 some percent of the problem seems to be with study design. Sex and other biological variables, they're telling us we no longer want to see studies that are just done in the male or just in adults. We want you to justify why you're um, um, <coughs> selecting your, your um, population. And then this one, the authentication of key biologicals and chemical resources. Again, I see this one and my hope goes up because this is low hanging fruit. This is something we could do better and they're asking us to, oops, wrong way. Um, in, in their publications about this, they make it very clear though that they know that this isn't enough. They're going to need other activities and I think they're pointing at us in our institutions, training programs and in our laboratories to do more. <clears throat> so um, I, I mentioned um, private research organizations. This is one I'm familiar with through the, um, my work in the veterinary world. This is a, one of these prize um, groups. So Dr. Mickelson is putting up quite a bit of money, $50 million, $25 million available to grants looking for um, a very high bar. So he's looking for a treatment that will um, both males and females, dogs and cats, sterilize with a single injection. So very high bar. Um, but as part of this, they're going to reproduce the, the uh, prize winning work um, with the contract research organization. So they're asking for some um, credible assurance of the quality of the work. So that's um, one model. Um, this one I think is interesting. We talked about government agencies. The Irish government has decided they're going to have an auditing system for basic research, all right? So basic researchers are going to need to open up their laboratories and let these auditor teams come in and um, look at the quality of their research. <clears throat> and then this is a professional organization, the American Society for Quality, which quite a few years ago made the point that we should really have a national quality standard for biomedical research. And they based their quality standard on an international ISO standard, which anyone familiar with ISO 9001? It's a full quality management system, very rigorous and I think very difficult to reach um, in, a, in our usual basic research um, environment. I think it's worthy of reaching for. But this, this would change life as we know it um, if, if we actually had a national standard. And I'll tell you, um, my perspective now is I, I don't think we should have a mandatory quality standard, but I think as scientists we should be pushing for a voluntary one that we get to define. That's my bias. 
All right, so that's what other people are doing. And they've worked hard and they've worked fast and they've already got plans and procedures in place. I've not seen the same kind of robust reaction from institutions and from scientists. And I've been to several different places, certainly around the US and even a couple internationally. And, and I think that's very true. We are, not, we are not the front of the line in discussing this issue. And I'm thinking maybe we should be because otherwise we're reacting to all our other stakeholders and we're letting them be the ones to say, we think this is best, please meet our target. Okay, so that's just, um, again, a little bit of my perspective. So to get into this discussion of where should we be, I, I'd like to take us just for a few minutes back to what we've normally done. We've done good science for hundreds of years and I think that's absolutely true. Um, so it isn't like we've, we've um, been poor performers. But what would you say our traditional gatekeepers would be? Anyone in the room? What, how, do we, how do we feel good about our science? What do we do? What do we put in place? Peer review, absolutely. That's a bedrock, right? Peer review, what else? Before peer review, before we get there, how do we get there? You folks are um, in your, tell me about the people in the room. Are you in the first couple years of your graduate training? Are you faculty who, yes? So how'd you get there? Advanced degrees. Advanced degrees. So another word for mentoring, right? That's kind of the, co we, 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 we go through a PhD training program. We go through a master's program. All right, so that's, this is my kind of list of what would be our traditional gatekeepers. Definitely mentoring, we depend on it. We, that we, we go as a graduate student to work with somebody who's going to help us um, hone our craft. We have peer review. We have what's called, considered the self-correcting nature of science. We believe that we, we do our best work, we publish our work, and if there's something that's not quite right, somebody's going to report on that in the future. Or if there's something that's great, someone's going to replicate it and we're going to go on and build on that work. And so sooner or later, the truth will win out is something we believe in. And then in the regulated world where, where we have human patients, you know, um, involved in our research, we rely on regulation. And a lot of that regulation is based on quality assurance systems to ensure the safety and efficacy of the um, interventions. So let's think about the mentoring issue. If we're relying heavily on mentoring, um, there, are, there are some research on research papers that have been published. This one is um, Brian Martinson from Health Partners here in Minnesota and Melissa Anderson, also a faculty member at Minnesota. They um, did a, a survey of NIH funded early and mid-career scientists. So these should be people, if you're NIH funded, you've got some good mentors, you've got some solid infrastructure around you. And they were asked questions about their own behaviors in an anonymous way. Um, and these are the results that came from their survey. And I'll just let you look at those. And again, think of those categories of your reproducible results. So we have um, about 12% saying that they feel influenced by pressure from um, some of the funding organizations. I think that's, that's um, a real issue, and especially now that we're less money from the state, less money from the NIH. It could be that scientists feel pressured about the results or their even ability to report them. Um, and inadequate or inappropriate research design, we're back to that same issue again. Again, I think that's fair. If 14% of us wish we could do better there, I think that's a fair assessment. Dropping observations, I've done that. And I'm absolutely convinced I did it for all the right reasons. But what I realize now, now that I've got my foot in this um, records world, that what I didn't do was perhaps describe enough in my lab notebook or um, because there might be a time later where you found out it wasn't really an outlier. So I think that's something that, that um, I can recognize. 
But what really struck me here is, again, this high number of scientists who aren't too satisfied with their record keeping for whatever reasons. And my reasons would have been, I don't have time, I didn't think it was important, or it was never stressed that much. And um, again, I think it's more timing. And uh, um, But I think that's low-hanging fruit. And we saw in that others in the, um, the uh, paper with the four categories that protocols and data analyses and records were, were um, perhaps a risk. What they concluded in this study was that um, they really felt that some of these questionable research practices that you saw in that chart were way more important than fraud. Now, this study was several years ago um, when, they, when we were just trying to sort out what is the contribution of, of um, fraud and um, fabrication. So they called attention to this wider range of questionable research practices. Now here's another one. Um, this one more recent, 2013, gets back to um, your point about methods. And again, for me, this is low-hanging fruit, going back to the NIH saying we want you to be, do better work with your um, reagents and resources. So this group recognizes that we have to be able to uniquely identify resources in order to repeat work, right? If you can't, you're dead in the water. So they designed an experiment with a rubric to go back and look over time at many papers and just ask themselves the question, could we do it if we wanted to? Could we identify research resources in the biomedical research literature? Now as scientists, again, prepare to be disappointed. 54% they couldn't reproduce, okay? And it's not that, it's that they weren't uniquely identified. So it's just missing information in the papers. Here's another one. Um, whose sample is it anyway? In this paper, they're looking, about, they're looking at um, transcript, transcriptomic studies. Now, this is not my field, so um, bear with me. But my understanding of this paper is you should be able to tell based on how they've, they've set up their data and if it's been labeled a sample from a male, that there's a, there's a corresponding data that should, that should fit as a male. So very simple study. They're saying for all the, in, this paper, in these papers, for the ones that are called male, did they match with male characteristics? <clears throat> as a simple test of their data, widespread mislabeled samples in 46% of the data set studied. Okay, again, low hanging fruit. One last one, this one's an interesting one. Gene name errors due to using Excel spreadsheets. This, and you're shaking your heads. What, what, does anyone know what happened in this? Or what's happened to you? I feel like I've heard it's like autocorrect. Exactly, exactly. Simple, embarrassing. So it takes your, you, you give a razzle dazzle name with letters and digits and it means something to you and Excel changes it to a date and that goes un undiscovered in your publications. And so people try to replicate it and, you know, it's messy. One-fifth of the papers had that problem. Interesting, right? And you know how hard we work to do good work. And, and um, when you look at some of the research on research, you learn these things. So what we're talking about here is a lot of problematic record keeping. And in my mind, this is somewhat simple stuff. Um, and I'll tell you that it's not just basic research that has this problem. Even in regulated research where the FDA comes and knocks on your door um, and goes through your data, so you, and you have a quality system in place, that, and, and uh, as you'll see in a few moments, these quality assurance are very documentation heavy. And in spite of that, having to have that kind of system, the most common deficiencies, and I go to the Society for Quality Assurance meetings every year, and the FDA stands up and gives you a list of what were the problems in the places they visited. Year after year, it's the same. It's, it's this issue with documentation or lack of consistent procedures. Um, so if you go back to this um, slide, you'll see that a lot of these issues, might, we might be able to get these numbers down by just do, spending a little more time in those areas. Laboratory protocols, we could do that. Some of us do already, but we could do better. It's just to, 
just for to get more consistency in our work and to make our publications easier to write to ensure we've got the detail we need. Biological reagents and reference materials, definitely good records would help. Data analysis and reporting, again, having a clear path of why analysis was chosen. So in this paper where he looked at the, um, the price tag of this work, they do make this um, comment that these some small steps might lead us to um, large gains in reproducibility. So now I'm going to move into um, just having us think about, we, we know what the um, funders are thinking, we know what the publishers are thinking, I think we know what the public is thinking. What are we thinking? And uh, this commentary was also C. Glenn Begley, I don't know if you remember, but the, um, the call to action paper I mentioned earlier was written by him as well. And now, in, that was in 2012, now in 2015 he's, he and his team have published this article which is actually really interesting. And I really like this cartoon because if you can see we've got the funders over there and they're kind of falling apart, hit, by, um, hit with their band-aids because they're throwing half their money away. And the, the budgets are decreasing, right? We have Nature, the publishers that are still standing but showing a little bit aware because there have been steady increases in retractions in the scientific literature, so their face is a bit red. And we've got the beleaguered scientists who's just seeing their infrastructure around them doing no nothing really to support the work they do. And then we have institutions that are kind of asleep at the wheel here thinking all's well and um, relying on those traditional gatekeepers to um, keep this boat afloat in spite of the evidence that shows perhaps we're sinking. And in that article they recommend what they call GIP, which good institutional practices. And there are several suggestions in there including a look at the incentive system, um, but also the one that I'm um, interested in is this idea that could we do better, could we as institutions support our scientists with some infrastructure, with some support to help um, uh, maybe manage some of these issues with our training programs in terms of study design bias, with our infrastructure support for some of these um, um, data, data management um, and considerations of that. And they're basically saying, you know what, you should be looking as hard as, it, as this as you look at um, other um, research integrity issues. Aya Cook for animal, animal Husbandry, the biosafety and clinical work. Those are all, again, heavily regulated. We may not want to go there, but we should perhaps be thinking about giving it the same attention. So um, as I think about this and I think about what could we do as institutions and as you think about what kind of support your science might need, we're at a point where we can brainstorm about what might these good institutional practices look like. And so from, for me, I, I'm interested in your thinking um, in terms of what keeps you up at night in terms of your data. What, what are the risks? Because in a little while I'm going to be coming at you with some um, quality assurance best practices, which, you, which if anyone here works in a regulated lab before or done GOP studies, um, you'll know that there's some of that that's not that much fun, right? It can be, you know, some of that can be irritating and bureaucratic and feel like overreach. But the good thing about those practices is they're meant to mitigate risk. So what are, if we wanted to put in place some things, what, what risks do you feel? Um, what are your challenges? When I work with research teams now that want to get a little bit of QA around their projects and that's where we always start. What, what do you worry about at night? So anyone have, want to share anything? Is there anything about the, the, your data? Let's, this is all about our data that you wish you had a better handle on or that you're not sure um, whether you're controlling, you're being a good steward of the data. I know it's, it's hard to think this fast. What else have I got on there? Yeah. Is there a biological variability in certain cell life cycles, which is really the imaging point of biology? 
Right. So this whole idea of understanding the error, whether it's around subjective things like how wh what what might make an image different, or or things that can make the image look different, like sample handling, or or um, yes, that's that's a huge. So if I was working with you in your area, I would start thinking about that. My mind would start going to, well, are there certain things we know might make this image look different? Is there a sample handling issue? Is there a, is there a, um, a, a position where it comes from issue? Do we know that? You know, that kind of brainstorming. Because if there are some of those things that are known, then you can have a consistent procedure to help you reduce that error load. Anyone else? I find the error around a measurement a really exciting place to play because once you figure out what it is, you've got most of your work done, right? It's the, what you, it's not knowing what you don't know that makes that hard. Okay, well let me just um, tell you what keeps me up at night. We'll go, go through this. Um, I, I will say that this perspective is going to change depending on whether you're the PI, whether you're the lab scientist um, or the lab manager who has to keep several different projects together, whether you're a student coming in to learn, or whether you're a technician that does the work for the PI, what keeps you up at night is going to differ. And, and you, those in that team, might not realize the power of, of whatever it is keeping somebody awake at night. Um, so for PIs, PIs may, may be very concerned about data leaving the laboratory that, that they didn't quite have control of. And two years later, they've got a new area that suggests some of that older data is really important. And now they've got no access to that data. So that, you know, the data stewardship issue. Here's some of the things that um, I think we need to think about with data in multiple ways. So we have that data soundness idea, the science, which is kind of in all of your laps. Is my data, are my data sound? Am I looking at design? Have I thought about error? We have the data management issue, which the library, I'll just give them a plug. The library folks have got some great help available to us as scientists on what they call data management, which is different than what I call it in quality assurance. But they will, they, they will come and work with you on an, as an individual scientist and talk to you about naming conventions for columns, you know, um, spreadsheet columns, so that three years from now somebody will understand what you meant or other scientists will understand what you meant. They'll talk to you about data management plans. They'll help us with this big data issue that we're, that you way more than me are going to be confronted with. And then there's um, the things that I'm interested in, which is the quality of the data. Does it stay the same from beginning to end? Um, and I think we need to have several different groups. We need to have the um, research integrity folks helping us. We need to have IT helping us. We need to have um, scientist training programs helping us. And we need to be thinking about all these things at once in terms of this reproducible research. So m my sense is that we really need a, a institutional mission-based approach to data quality and we should be talking about it in all arms of our, of our mission. So I started out in the service arm because we had to have quality systems in place. But I'm thinking now we should be talking about some of this work in all of our missions for the reasons you see here. So now let me tell you, in the last um, few minutes of my talking time, what I'm thinking we could do, what would, might be a strategy that I'd like your opinion on, and that is, could we as scientists, before we have to, due to regulations, come up with our own self-defined um, voluntary commitment to what's what I call um, research quality assurance, or it's often called good research practices, okay? So these could be, these could happen from an individual level. We don't have to wait for our institutions to support us, which is what I think should happen, but probably won't. But we can do this as individual scientists. We could do this as laboratories. We could do it as programs. That's what we're trying to do at the vet school. 
eventually, I'm hoping the, at the institutional level, there might be some support so that we don't all have to reinvent the wheel and group by group by group. Um, and the reason I'm intrigued by quality assurance is because quality assurance systems, you know, which usually are, are making widgets, right, or in regulated work, they're basically designed to improve and maintain the precision and accuracy of a product and establish routine performance. Now we think of that in terms of gizmos, but I'd like us to think about what we produce, which are data, inference, and publications. So that is now our products. And of course, we're producing the next generation of scientists with our mentoring programs. And yet support for this kind of um, help with data stewardship is rarely found. I've not seen it anywhere um, in an academic setting unless you're doing regulated work, okay? And then you, you have to do it. So it's, um, but it's, but it rarely trickles down. And this is true in research institutions as well. Now QA usually comes in here, if you look at the translational pipeline, and most of us are in basic research, um, disease discovery and drug discovery, but in the developmental pipeline, when you're actually um, working with human patients and you need to, to you know, um, assure safety and efficacy, you have to have quality systems in place. So it's by federal law, right? You need to do good laboratory practices, good manufacturing practices, or good clinical practices. All of those have quality systems in place because they believe and they know that that helps assure sa the safety and efficacy of, of the research. However, when we're um, where we are, there's, there's none of this consistent expectation. There's no consistent expectation other than go out there and do good work. And um, hopefully you'll have good mentors and the publishing, um, the publishing system won't let you down. And so I'm, I'm thinking that we could take some of the good stuff and, and try to voluntarily, based on our risk and on our, our type of science, apply some of these best practices. And again, the reason is it, it generates evidence. So we're now in, a, in an environment where we have to express why should you have confidence in the quality of our work as scientists. We have all the evidence that shows you shouldn't, 11%. What can we do to show you you should have confidence in us? Well, these kind of systems give us evidence in the terms of documentation and, in the, and monitoring and continuous improvement. And now these terms all probably sound like gobbledygook, but the system really does ensure that. And this is, I'm not going to spend much time, so um, I, I, I know it feels like a lot of bureaucracy, but it is a systematic approach to some of the things that we need to be able to reconstruct data. So when you think about um, equipment, can, can we really, do we have equipment records that show our equipment work? If our data come out of equipment and we can't, we can't reflect that the equipment works, our data are basically useless and we tend to forget that left, right and center. Um, do we have records about the people who are performing the, the research? Do we really know they were trained in techniques? Do we have standard operating procedures to ensure that routine things are done the same? Um, and do we look at errors? Do we look at things that go wrong and do we just tell ourselves we know why that happened or do we do a systematic approach so that we can prove we've corrected it in the right way? So when you have a system in place like that, or pieces of it in place, you really do generate credible evidence. And if we don't have any of those in place, are we really supporting the quality of our data? Are the people we're training really getting the skills they need to move into industries that require working in these systems? So now just a few questions um, for you to think about your own data. Um, how good do you feel about the um, security and, and ability of your data to be, to have the characteristics here, which are considered the characteristics of good data? Documentation, consistency and procedures, and then my favorite, because in, yeah, in academic settings, we all get a little fidgety when we are asked, can we really stand up for the reliability of our equipment? <clears throat> and I think, um, this article was in Nature and actually um, it's a co another commentary talking about 
these issues are becoming more important. Scientists are going to be asked more frequently to provide evidence about the quality of their work and um, how are we doing in that endeavor. And so I think we do need strategies to address this. And I'd like to think about what are the challenges. And I'll bet you may already um, have a sense of what those challenges are. There are resources that have been available since the 90s pushing us to, ex to embrace some of these best practices. They have not been embraced, not in academia, not really in industry. Um, but I've provided for you in the handout a list of some of those. They're actually excellent. They're freely available. They give you a roadmap to how to integrate some of these best practices if you're interested. Um, we're, we're working on a training program in an academic institution. Of course, we need to train. And so um, Yoji and I are working on a, um, creating a program for T32 second year students to try to help work with them with their research and bringing on some of these um, quality assurance best practices. So, um, and then we're going to look at how effective that is. I'm not going to have you read much of that. But now I'd just like to stop. And for those of you who have worked in regulated systems, you might be able to help us discuss what those challenges might be. Do you see any? Or uh, what we're talking about are records. So record keeping takes more time, yes? You're a scientist who's got lots of good ideas. You want to spend a lot of time making more re records. These are the challenges I see. Um, d does it interest you at all? Are you one of the 35% of scientists who wish they could do record keeping better? Well, I mean, I can start off with good. So you're, let's take new young investigators. I guess two questions. So, one, um, I mean, you come into a research um, you know, opportunity and you're given a startup package. That's what you're right. given to start with. Um, is there sufficient funding mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, for a lot of these quality um, uh, measures to be implemented? Maybe that's one question. And I guess the second is if you're coming into the laboratory. Um, you know, are there established practices that the university has as an expectation, for instance, record keeping or naming a file or where do you store data? Has anyone in the room ever encountered um, standardized procedures for either of those? That's my experience as well. Um, so I, th I think at the moment, there are no there are no expectations associated with the quality of record keeping. That's really a lot of what the sort of soapbox I'm I'm standing on. Um, it is that I think that we've always, as scientists, we've never really had to consider the quality assurance world. It was absolutely new to me. The only reason I know about it is because I had to help with an accreditation project. So I think it's not an expectation. I think um, we are inexperienced with it. And what I would hope five years from now, if our trainees left here, that when they go to their new places and ask for their startup packages, that they would say, how do you support quality assurance? Can any of my funding go to, to um, perhaps have an electronic quality management system to help me manage my documents? Um, you've got to know what to ask for, and you've got to know what helps. And at the moment, I think it's a big gap. And in terms of money, I can tell you what we've done. And, and you're going to laugh because you know what I'm describing is not sustainable. But I've been trying to work with research, researchers um, kind of as a proof of concept. So I've, I've talked with my researchers and I've said, if you want our help. So we're an internal service organization, which means someone has to pay because we have to cover our salary. But we, I've said, if, if we can come in and work with you before you put your grant in, tell me about your grant. Let's figure out the risk for your data. And my team will come in and we'll promise in your grant proposal that we're going to have standardized proce operating procedures for routine work, that we're going to know the equipment inventory, and we're going to have reagent um, inventories. And the two examples I can give you, they were developing new methods. And so we said, we will have. SOPs for lab notebooks and for test validation documentation. 
and that will be viewed by an external quality program and monitored. We put that in the grant and it got, it got funded twice and then um, I was talking about this at another meeting and someone told me they were at the grant review for that and that it was viewed favorably. At another talk I gave there was an NIH head in the audience and when I said I think they will pay for it, she stood up and said we will absolutely pay for it. She said even if you don't get funded, you're, you will score higher because you've paid attention to some of these quality assurance pieces. So that's anecdotal evidence and what I'd really like to do is to be able to show that some of these interventions do improve success of um, funding but also of data reconstruction. You know, can we show it's better with or without? Yes, Yoji. Can you cite examples where you've where you've helped the laboratory implement some of these best practices and on an ongoing basis, how much money does that actually cost the laboratory? Do, do you have any sense oh, of that? Oh, yes, that's such a good question. Um, I can tell you, in terms, I can tell you what it costs to do the, uh, the really big job, like for the veterinary diagnostic lab, it's about 25% of the time of their staff to do a full QA system. Um, and it's, and I think that's a reasonable, so year one in terms of workload, you should, you should expect at least a 15 to a 20 percent workload requirement. Then once you're up and going, it becomes routine and it's less. Um, the cost issue, you know, it depends on what you're lumping into QA. If you're talking about equipment calibration and verification strategies, you know, it can get high fast. If you're talking about how long and how much does it cost to get um, QA in place, I can tell you it takes about a year and a half for a big group. Small group, we did it in about six months and now they're self-sustaining without us. They do self-assessments and peer assessments. I'm working on a model where we could just help people get it up and going and then come in and audit maybe twice a year, friendly audits. Remember, we're all part of the same team. We're in there to show, to show where you could do better or to keep you from sliding. And I think that could be as, you know, um, oh, anywhere between 2,500 and 5,000 a year depending on a program. But a program could be big. So the $2,500 is what we put in these small grants. And, and of course, we, that was, we, we, our time was much more than that, but, um, and that's just time. So there's lots, of, my strategy is it should be part of our faculty work to help other groups and then it shouldn't cost as much, right? But um, right now I'm still part of an ISO and I think that's one of the things that definitely needs to change. We just need to be able to be advisors. And then the cost to you, our time, and throwing away expired things even though you think they still work, <laughs> that's a cost. Or generating data to show they still work, you can do that. And then the equipment verification and, and calibration is a big deal. Does that give you an idea? Like it sounds like some, some laboratories you've worked with actually built this into their grant application they did. budget. So can you give us a sense of like how much money were they asking for? Yeah, $2,500 in those small projects. Mm -hmm. But remember this was, a, this was like a, a, a year project. And, um, but I can also tell you, and this is, we, we have a um, project that's a um, shared infrastructure. So it's one of these research cluster type programs and we're putting in a QA system to help that. And that's at about 20,000 a year to get it all up and going. But then it's going to roll back to maybe about seven and I'm hoping it'll be less than that. But that, you know, that's, that's a lot of training and that's a lot of hand-holding and that's a lot of monitoring. And, but those are the kind of strategies I'm looking for. If, if we built it, <laughs> what, you know, what kind of help would people need and our, our cork program Yoji I'm I'm trying to think of could we do this on a workshop basis like the library does I gotta tell you the library folks work for free you know that's 
That's an important model. That's a wonderful model. In an academic setting, you should be able to have a system. Yes, please. <clears throat> so thank you for this uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions, please. So sometimes, especially for young investigators, we usually like outsource some of our experiments. Mm -hmm. So for example, I've been doing real-time PCR. I send the uh, samples for the genomic center. I do something like that. So how we control the quality of the data coming from these sources? What a great question. Um, so the, the question is, we, we, we're outsourcing data. Now you could outsource data to other researchers who probably aren't on the same level as the genomics core or the, the core laboratories, right? Um, so that's one issue. But the core laboratories is another issue. And interestingly, I gave this kind of talk at a meeting of the core, NIH core laboratories last year. And I was amazed to find out that core laboratories do not consistently have quality systems in place. So this is new to them as well. And so I'm now with a group that's trying to come up with tools and templates that can be on a website for core laboratories to try to figure out how to address research <coughs> reproducibility. So the answer really is to ask them that question. Can you describe your um, quality assurance system is the question I'd ask them. And um, every time I ask a scientist that question, they come back to me with, well, I do quality control. And that was the same thing I said before I understood what quality assurance was. Because quality assurance is a whole big system of, you know, um, equipment management, personnel management, error management. It's not just quality control. So ask that question. How do you, how do you control for error in results? What kind of quality system do you offer me? And if they say, gee, nothing, don't get mad because most of us haven't had training in this. We, 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 think, we think quality control. So then instead you, could, you can ask, tell me more about the quality control because they probably do that. Tell me about how you, if you calibrate your equipment on a reliable basis. And if they start answering no, 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 well then you might want to find a different laboratory because good scientists are going to be trying to think about these things and they may have answers that aren't, I have a quality management system. But you have to know to ask those questions. Otherwise, you're vulnerable. Another question is, if you want to um, include this quality assurance part in a grant proposal, mm -hmm. at what stage uh, someone should approach you? Very early. Just like statisticians. <laughs> we can't fix it afterwards. Um, so very early because, uh, you know, what, and, and again, I don't want to frighten anybody off thinking that, that's, that quality assurance means you have to do everything. Everyone thinks you've got to have an SOP to how you open the door. No, what we look at is where's, where are the risks to your data. For instance, we're working with a researcher who's worried about the confidentiality of data. He's getting producer data and it's coming from here to him and it's going to student A and student B and student C's in, you know, Pakistan and how are the producers going to feel about these data being everywhere. So we're focusing totally on verifying that those data are secure, that people are trained to not use jump drives and that they have to use university computers. This is just an example of working on the risk. So we might not care at all what he's doing with reagents. So come early or talk to someone early and then know, know from where your risk comes. Okay? Yes. Side of equipment calibration, is there one thing you would tell everybody in this room to be doing? Like, is there one thing that we should be doing differently? E Equipment's a big one <laughs> because we, we tend to be very vulnerable in, um, in academic institutions. Um, so I, uh, that's my first answer is ask questions about your equipment. And the answer of, the answer I get when I talk with scientists, and did I say this already? Um, when I ask people, how do you manage your equipment, the PI will look at me and say, well, when it's broke, I'm the one who gets it fixed. And that's the equipment management system. Well, I understand that and that's, that's what most of us do, but you have no way of knowing, you know, was there any effect of it going downhill over time. So that, and then the other thing I think would be to focus on quality control, depending on the type of science you're doing, 
you know, that's the one thing that tells you, are my methods fit for purpose? And thinking hard about whether your quality control fit your experiment. You know, in veterinary medicine, if you're using a human quality control in a dolphin test, you might not be proving that your methods fit for purpose. So having a really good understanding of controlling your, your method. And then and having that written down so other people in the lab know it and people can follow that approach. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and let me tell you um, again, not not trying to um, to to sell this any harder than I'm trying to sell this. Um, what my dream is, is that when you leave our academic institutions and you've done your research, that you can say on your, on your resumes, on your CVs, that your work was done use under, in a culture of, of quality. So your work was performed um, according to quality assurance best practices. And then, and you know, the trick here is to be very specific about what those best practices are. You don't want to overpromise. But, you know, if an industry sees that, it's going to set you apart from others because industry people tell me they hate hiring new PhDs because it takes them a year and a half to get used to working in a quality system and not thinking, you know, it's bureaucratic nightmare and it's too much work and trust me, I'm, a, um, I'm an NIH, NIH funded PhD scientist. So I, I, I'd like to think we're adding value to your training. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about our, our academic incentives being misaligned, and I wonder if yes. you could give some examples of ideas that you've had and how to realign those in a, yeah. in a better way. That is going to be such an interesting discussion. You know, I think about it's already hard enough to, to move a ship, and, and that's why I, my brain can incorporate some of the low-hanging fruit. When we start about talking about the incentives, th those conversations are real and the kinds of suggestions that are being made by the publishers are um, let's move away from impact factor journals. It's, you know, they're, they're saying there must be a better way to um, deal with that. But then they're also saying let's start rewarding scientists based on whether they share their data. And so now take yourself back to being a four-year-old and getting your sticker for good behavior. They're suggesting things like badges, where on your paper there would be a badge to reflect a certain, a, 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 what they think is a more appropriate research um, approach or activity that makes your work more repeatable. So maybe if over time your study does get reproduced, you, 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 you become known for that. That data are out, those data are out there. Um, mentoring, if you have a, if there's some way of determining if you have a solid solid, solid um, history of mentoring and your people go out and do good work, that becomes a new data set. So these are the kind of discussions as a group would be fun to have. What should we be rewarding? What, what is the right stuff? What are the right stuff? Yes. So that makes a lot of sense to me from a broad sort of macro level. Mm -hmm. But when we think about sort of what are the incentives for us as junior faculty <coughs> at an institution, such as this, when we think about a, a dean or leadership who right. is saying first and last authored publications are what's going to get you tenure, um, where does the sort of shift need to begin or how can it begin at that level? Boy, I wish I had the answers. Here's what, here's in, in my simple way of looking at it, sometimes this has to be scientist driven. Sometimes we maybe need to like take this discussion and say, we're hearing, we're reading about re research reproducibility issue. One of the things that are being said, and it's being said loud and clear, so it's not, we're not making this up, that the incentive issue is a problem. What are we doing here at the University of Minnesota about this? Are our department heads getting together and saying, what might be good? Better yet, are the scientists and department heads getting together and saying, what could we imagine? We have to imagine it first, right? Um, many, I can tell you many universities are having um, research reproducibility days where they're inviting people in to talk about these topics and, you know, like a, a symposium. 
and that might be something we could propose or suggest or I mean we, we have a voice and most of our department heads and administrators are hungry for this too I would say we have had a lot of support at the vet school for this idea yeah you said that uh, outright fraud is outright fraud is thought to be rare in research how, how do we how do we know that doesn't seem like the kind of thing somebody had missed. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's probably reporting error there. Um, well, when they when they go and look at, um, at so this research on research, one we know of people who get caught, and we know what what. So of course that could be totally underreported. We also know when you look at retractions, what were the real reasons for that retractions, and some of those retractions are outright fraud, and they're discovered, but many more. Are questionable research practices, or they're, um, they get found to be that there's a mistake. And so there are data that quantify that um, in the literature, and and that's the belief that it's that rare. But you know, it's like bad behavior anyway. It, it's only counted if it's caught. But wouldn't you like to hope it's not 35% like poor reporting? It can't be, or we're just all doomed, <laughs> right? I mean, um, you ask scientists, have you, do you know, have you experienced someone who's perpetrated fraud? And scientists will say, yes, they have or they do, right? Feel like they, they couldn't prove it. Let's say you don't have to necessarily fr prove it, but you believe it. But yeah, but where do you want to focus, right? And and you know when I think about quality assurance, what I usually say at that slide is QA is not going to fix fraud. It's going to make it harder for them because it's going to give them more places where they have to document what they're doing wh while they're cheating. But if they're going to cheat, they can document. So QA isn't really going to fix fraud. But if I know 35% of, of my um, the people I admire are thinking that they wish they could do record keeping better, I'd rather work with them. <laughs> the fraud just bums me out, right? We can't, we just can't fix bad. But, what, but if we catch them, we can get rid of them. Yes? I guess I have a uh, question just about, so with the, with the QA, mm -hmm. people are seeking out the help and the resources for different reasons, right? So, you know, they want to make sure their lab is doing a really good job and then Maybe if someone accuses them of doing something yes. not so great, they have the record for themselves. Yes. But in terms of getting better publications um, for the whole field or community, wouldn't the QA really have to be transparent to everyone? Yeah. So like in the peer review process, I see exactly yeah. what you did. Yes. So then how would that get enforced? How would it get enforced? Well, because people don't do things unless they have to. Yeah, and this, this, this is why I like talking to groups like this, because is that true? Do we not do stuff until we have to? Or could we be a leading voice and say we want to do things right now? You're seeing my Pollyanna hat. And, and um, I, I think we can do things because we want to do things right. And if we wait to be enforced, we probably won't have to wait too long. Right? Something bad will happen in basic research. And it's just like in other systems, they're going to come down and say, all right, you guys need to prove to us. So should we lead? Could, could we do it because it's the right thing? Could we try to encourage rewards to that? I.e., maybe you'll get hired faster if you've done that. Maybe, your pub, maybe the journals will start requ requesting, what do you do for quality assurance? Granting agencies already do, but they'll tell you that it's sort of, um, if you look at, at um, some of the uh, grant agencies and they say describe your quality assurance, just about every scientist will describe their CV and their quality control approach. That's because we don't know any better. But what if we're the first group that knows better <laughs> and we, we start putting that in? And that's been my experience. We put in a kind of a big QA piece into a grant, one of the Minnesota Future Grants. We weren't funded, but and it was a big collaborative group, but we had a big QA piece in there for about 10 or 12,000, maybe 15. And the response from the reviewers were, we liked the QA piece. It would have been good to have. It could have been a pilot for, you know, institution-wide 
practices. So I think at the beginning there's a real advantage to us because we'll stand out. Five years from now, maybe it'll be business as usual um, and you won't have as much of an advantage. But by then it'll just be the way we do our science, just like I cook. I remember back in the 80s, the veterinarians were all saying, we do not need regulation and how to look after animals. That's what we do. Well, we did. <laughs> we did. And it's a pain, but it's made us better. Um, but you said something important there. Um, let me see if I can take myself back. Oh, that we might do this and we, we might do this and just end up ticking the boxes. You know, we might say, I'm going to put a quality system in place or I'm going to have a checklist and I'm going to tell people this is how I do my work. And that really um, sort of wears me out because I think that could be the biggest risk is that people will do the um, kind of online education thing of ticking the boxes and saying you've done everything. This is truly not worth doing if we're just going to pretend we're doing it because it's hard work and then that, you know, the whole purpose of being able to be accountable for our data goes out the window. I think the best argument is the stewardship. It's our data. We care about it. No one cares about our data more than we do. If we can't find it halfway through the life cycle, we're going to be disappointed. Can I just Does that ask help? one more <laughs> do you think, you know, question about yes. that? Um, so I work um, primarily in a realm of big data and mm -hmm. um, things of that nature and the analysis side. So I know from experience nowadays, to get your data published, you have to publicly have it available. And for the most part, um, people say, say, yes, I'm going to do this, it's available here, but it's never in a form you could actually right. ever use or check. So yes. I feel like in the same, like for quality assurance, will it be the same thing? Yes, I'm doing this, but no, I'm not really doing it because I think the challenges are less with quality assurance because you're going to know, again, this is, this is about, these are your records and, and, and really the onus isn't so much on that somebody else is going to come and look at them. It's that eventually after that first year and a half of integration pain, it's going to make your life better. And so you're going to be able to write your paper, this is what the feedback I get, I can write my papers quicker now because I've got it. I can find my data because I know I have a, SOP that says you don't leave my lab with my data, you know. So it's going to start helping you and that's what's going to keep it going. That's the only thing that will sustain it. In terms of your issues with big data, that is something that's gone so fast and so hard and, and I think pe the people who are trying to help are just racing to keep up and I think those things will get better and I, and I know the library people have got a real good grip on some of these issues and are willing to help. So I think that's a maturity. Science has gone faster than the procedures and practices. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think some labs have transitioned to sort of electronic, right. you know, laboratory notebooks, right. but others are still using the kind of right. the old school lab notebooks with the, yep. you know, the industry standard with, you know, having a copy and signing off yeah. on those pages. Yeah. Is it easy? Is it, does technology help yeah. in implementation or does it make it worse? You know what? I, I think it's going to help, but there are going to be those that it's going to make worse. And the transitions are always the hardest part. So we do have, um, we do have a, we have an electronic quality management system in, in, uh, in our vet school. And that's what made me think we could share some of these skills because it allows you to, you know, you put all your documents in there. When something needs updating, you get an email. When your equipment is gone, you know, it's coming up to needing verification, you get an email. Um, if you've got a, 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 a problem and you haven't really figured out the root cause, there's, there's something there tapping you on the shoulder. It's very nice. It makes doing QA a lot easier. Um, that's part of the cost though. So it, with electronic notebooks, I think if you're doing the kind of work that um, the electronic notebook would be really 
would really be supportive of is, from my understanding of these notebooks, and I've seen a couple, you know, you put your data in and it's got that kind of internal audit trail. So now you don't need six forms to do one piece of information, right? And it's there. And the PI can see it and the other team members can see it and, and it's auditable. The challenges with the notebooks are, well, what if your data, you know, what if you have to take it to the barn or what if you take it, you're getting data in from somewhere else and you don't know, um, you know, those transitions are harder to control. So one of the one of the grants that I didn't get funded, you want to hear all my grants that don't get funded, was um, looking at electronic notebook use. Could we have a group that do have them and a group that don't? And could we see, was data reconstruction better, faster? Did the researchers find it of value? What were the challenges in um, um, value added of using them. So I think they're really worth a try and I'll plug the library folks again. They've done a good job of reviewing several different notebooks. We have researchers in the vet school who are using electronic notebooks. They're not terribly expensive, $100 a researcher a year. That's not too bad. Um, it'd, be, it'd be really interesting to see what we thought about it. Anyone used them? before? Anyone interested in them? It'd be fun to have a demo. I've seen, I've had some vet side demos and they're pretty interesting. I think it has to be part of the future. Paper can be a real pain. So I think we've hit on several of the challenges. Time, sustainability, would we really do it? Um, how do you get the value added? How do you change an institution? How do we get the expertise? These are not skills that are routinely found, right? Because there's not, because it hasn't been part of our training. How do we get enough for everybody? Okay, if we, anything else? All right, thanks so much. And the handout is available. <laughs>